this is a, a little odd for me. I'm used to the microphone being right here. Uh, anyway, I want to start by reading the Lord's Prayer. Now, if you want to repeat it with me as I read it, that's good. Uh, our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Your will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I wasn't planning on opening this morning. Uh, so I had been asking God for a word for the past few days. I hadn't heard anything. And then this morning I received a text <coughs> message from my mother. And the content of the message was the answer to something that I've been praying for probably for the <coughs> past two years. Uh, I'm not going to get into details, but I know that this is happening because of the plan that God has for me, for my marriage. Uh, and it has to do with something that he told me he was going to do for me. So after I got that message and I read it and all that, he impressed it upon my heart to talk about trusting and waiting on him. And this is the scripture that was, that was impressed on me right away. Uh, Hebrews 10, verses 35 and 36. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. It's very difficult for us, uh, you know, because of our human nature, to wait for something. We, we get impatient. And I've been very impatient for a long time, but i got to remind myself, told me that this is what he's going to do for me, so I'm just going to wait, <clears throat> you know, and, and the way we, we learn to become patient is because he helped us to, to do that, and, and that's done uh, with the test of our faith. In James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, it says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trine of your faith worketh patient. But let patient have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And the Bible also gives us a prophecy for waiting on the Lord. And this is from Isaiah 40, verse 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. We have been given the victory, and it is ours through Jesus Christ. We know that what is promised to us by the Lord is going to come to pass, and we don't have to wait. <clears throat> I was speaking to my best friend the other day, and I was reminded that our God is a God of now. Yes. Not of yesterday or tomorrow, right. but of now. So the promises that God has for our lives have already been fulfilled, yes. and now they're manifesting. Amen. So that's my short little message. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone has any prayer requests, testimony they would like to share? Jason. I've been kind of thinking the same way you've been thinking. Uh, I've, uh, my mother in law has been going through some things. She has cancer. And every time I'm in that waiting room, I always hear people say, On God's time, she'll be healed. On God's time, on God's time. And every and I'm just saying,
Yes. And uh, and if he's living in us, we should not put him on the time table. That's right. We shouldn't say, oh, God's time. We don't, when we pray, we don't pray on God's time. We pray, we're healed in the name of Jesus. And that is right. right now. Right now. Mm -hmm. So I, I've been kind of, I don't know, I guess I've been confused on why things aren't happening now, you know, when they're right now. But I think God's working with us to show us that
So we have to declare what God has already accomplished, whether it's salvation, whether it's healing, whether, you know, we confess with our mouth yes. what we believe in our heart, yes. and it shall come to pass. Yes. That's right. Now, healing sometimes, you know, there are instantaneous healing, <coughs> and there's also where Jesus says that we, we pray, and they shall be healed, right. mm -hmm. meaning it's a process sometimes. It isn't instantaneous. Sometimes it is a process. But we still have to pray as though it is done. Yes, that's, the, that's, right, yeah. that's what keeps us in the now God. In other words, it's what we're always talking about. Instead of focusing on the circumstance, we focus on Jesus. Right. He is the word made flesh. Right. So when our circumstances don't line up to the word, right. we focus on the word, not on the circumstances. Right. Come on, when now. the circumstance yeah. is there in this natural three-dimensional world to pull us out of the yes. spirit, Is that no, <laughs> challenge that. 
second guess God. And we've talked about it, and all of us know this. We think sometimes, ah, this is what I said last I think it was Wednesday night. Uh, boy, this has been going on all day. <laughs>
Bibles travel twice the speed of checks in the mail. <laughs> with fatty liver disease, so I'm just praying for healing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm hoping that it's going to be corrected with diet. Uh, go to the surgery. Uh, got a call yesterday from someone else in the church down there whose uh, mother has had a stroke and uh, the primary <coughs> care provider, Linda, is legally blind, so this is a real struggle for her to take care of her mom when she can't hardly see. But it's just that the Lord is at least working that. passed out four times this week and she's just laying on the floor saying God I'm ready to go to that other dimension just ready to cross over so let the Lord's will be done that she's not suffering that the Lord just allow her to pass it's a, it's a sure sign <laughs> and um, just been a great week this week I, I hired a lady and she's like I am just amazed she says this is just really something it's like we go in and clean for two hours and we sit for an hour and a half and talk to people or eat or whatever <laughs> Kind of a different, I said, well, I told you it was a different job when I was asking you kind of funny interview questions.
well, now you understand where I'm coming from. That, you know, if this will work out, then maybe this lady will be the one that can help me to, um, uh, and, and that it will be a growing process for her. She, she plays the piano over at her church, and she has a really sweet spirit, just a really sweet spirit. And, and she began to share with me that she's going through some real obstacles uh, with her <coughs> husband. So, you know, the Lord put us together for a reason. She's my third person in a month that I've gone to, and the only one that my spirit has really felt good about. Hallelujah. Um, so I just pray that the Lord would, you know, help that whole situation if we're working together that we can minister. I, I, I think I come here for my fuel, and then everything that's said somewhere comes up in conversation <laughs> during the week probably for all of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for you are our God of now. Let the manifestation of your promises and of your glory is happening right now as we speak this word, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the finished work of the cross. We give you all the praise and all the glory, Father. We thank you for listening to us, for sending us out into this world to share who you are, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your glory. Thank you, Father, for your There's restoration in this room right now. Restoration in the room right now. There are those who brought up the situation of being restored. I know it was about girlfriends and things like that, but the Lord said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and these things will be added unto you. So I pray that those that are like 90% sure they're totally in God's direction, God's God's plan, God's will, what he has in their life. The Lord wants to make it 100% sure in your heart right now. So as we sing, as the Lord leads, you all are led. Go ahead and pray for these that 
I believe that the Lord wants to totally restore and renew and set up for the future because at the end of the song it talks about restoring you so you can restore others so that you can live your life in victory that you can give others life and victory in their life that the kingdom would be furthered go ahead and pray have mercy on me my unfailing love have mercy on me my redeemer go ahead and minister go ahead and minister why are you looking Minister.
It's all lined up. <laughs> all right. <laughs> March 13th, we're going to have Eastern Gate House of Prayer. We're just going to go where we're led. So we're going to come in as kitties <laughs> and leave out as lions. <laughs> Yes, Saturday <laughs> night, this coming Saturday night, mm-hmm. uh, Sandy Pop. Oh. Yes, spring forward. Spring forward. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
Sometimes we ponder and wonder why and how come, but we know the outcome is for you. Yes. If we will keep our focus on you, all things will work for your glory. Yes, Lord. God, we don't understand some of the trials we go down or why, but we know an end result is you. Yes. And if we will hold our ground and stand in your word, yes. we shall be victorious. Yes. Hallelujah. You are the king of kings and lords of lords. Yes. Hallelujah. We know the Lord is in the room right now. We just want to declare to the rest of our being your presence, oh God.
One more. One more. <laughs> declare it. Let's declare it. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. The whole the devil had on me. No, he ain't got no more. the demons out of the man from Galilee. Well, he brought the blind man new, and he hold hope and new. And he brought back hope, back to both his life. Testify to you, I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. The whole the devil had on me. He ain't got no more. I've been delivered. I've been I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered by the hand of the Lord. Verse one, verse one. Jesus touched the blind man and made him see. Come on. He cast the demons out of the man from Galilee. He cleansed the leper too. He made the blind man new. He brought hope back into the hopeless life. He say someone I know this close to death He gave a boy with asthma back his breath But the greatest miracle to see Is the sin he set you free Yeah, when Jesus set you free Come on now You are free indeed I've been delivered I've been delivered I've been delivered the hold the devil had on me, he ain't got no more. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered by the hand of the Lord. Well, I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. I'm so glad Jesus lifted me. Set me free. Satan had me bound. Jesus set me free. Lifted me, singing glory, hallelujah. Jesus lifted me. Well, I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. The whole devil had on me. He ain't got no more. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered by the hand of the Lord.
been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. Oh, the devil had on me. He ain't got no more. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered by the hand of the Lord. Voices. No more. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered by the hand of the Lord. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. Hold the devil hand on me. He ain't got no more. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered. I've been delivered by the hand of the Lord. I've been delivered by the hand of the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise All I can God. say is a good thing no one caught that. Otherwise, it'd be really embarrassing. Thank you, Jesus. Well, hallelujah. Uh, that's the kind of stuff I was raised up in. Uh, I mean, not raised up in, but when I first got saved, I was already a full-grown idiot, but hallelujah. I was looking. I, I just about turned around to see John Belushi come doing backflips down that center aisle, you know. Anybody, <laughs> anybody ever see uh, Blues Brothers? Uh, it, it, they had an experience in the Lord, hallelujah. Yes. <laughs> anyway, God is good, isn't he? Yeah. Amen. Give him a big hand clap. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Praise God. Please be seated. And the uh, young people, you can be dismissed. Thank the Lord. Thank you, worship team. Thank all of you for being sensitive to the Holy Ghost and being obedient. Uh, in uh, whatever the Lord has led you or encouraged you to do. Amen. I, I promise you this, you cannot be a blessing without getting blessed. Hallelujah. Amen. Whatever flows through you has got to have an impact on you. So thank the Lord. Amen. I appreciate the presence of the Lord and amen, His Spirit that we're all experiencing here this morning. Praise God. And uh, uh, I want to thank all of you for your testimonies as always it, it it really does have an impact sometimes you think well I'm just saying something but listen uh, if you feel led to say something you need to say it even if you're not sure who's leading you hallelujah because <laughs> I'm telling you people get blessed yes. people are blessed when you share what the Holy Spirit's speaking to you and through you and uh, what's one of the main reasons why we come together as a body is to allow the Holy Spirit to speak in his different ways, you know. Uh, the scripture talks about, you know, in the time past, you know, God spoke through his prophets and the priests and so forth. But in this day, he speaks through Jesus Christ, and that Jesus is in you. So if we're going to hear from him outside of the written word, we need to, we need to hear from you, praise the Lord. So uh, God expects us to do that, and uh, we, really, we really need to. It's what encourages and blesses each of us. Amen. So we're going we're gonna to begin today in John chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 2 through 11, Sheila. And this is the, the wedding. Uh, and I, I've taught about this, or parts of this before, but there's so much here. Uh, some things came to my mind this week, and I went back over uh, this story again. And uh, it was amazing, you know, Suzanne was talking about the joy of the Lord is our strength. That is a major message. In fact, it is why Jesus came. The, in Luke chapter 2, it says, uh, joy to the world, or joy to all of man is going to be the result of this birth. And all the earth is going to receive joy. Well, it's not, joy is not just stupid, happy, you know. I mean, joy is something greater than, you can have joy even when everything isn't great. There still can be a settled sense of, you know, peace and joy. 
Uh, of course, when we're happy and things are going great, the joy just seems to be even greater. But that joy is something that we have uh, in Christ. He is not just joy to the world. He is the joy of the world. And uh, so there's some, some, some tremendous uh, truths in this story. And uh, here where it talks about uh, this miracle. This was the first miracle, I think it says in verse 11. Uh, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, just, but I want to set you up. I want you to listen to what's being said in the story because we get so used to a lot of these familiar ones that we, we just don't even bother to pay attention to what it is when we're reading them. We just kind of read through it because we think, well, I know that story. I've read it a thousand times. I've heard it all about it. But that word miracle there translates uh, sign. Actually, it, it's a say, uh, my, my Greek is not quite as good as my English. So you're in big trouble because, but it means semail, and semail is actually, it translates miracle, sign, or token. So that's what we're looking at here. It was his first sign or his first token of what he was going to be or do, and uh, it was a miracle at the same time. And so uh, with that in mind, and when Suzanne mentioned Lord of the Rings, I just I just about did the John Bellucci there, except he was 30 years younger when he did that, and probably on something much more than I'm on this morning, praise the Lord. <clears throat> I mean, from a natural standpoint, praise the Lord. I'm on the Holy Ghost, and you can't get any higher than that. But something to be said for pharmaceuticals at times when you really need them, hallelujah. I'm a child of the 60s, so okay, get me. Allow me my flashbacks every once in a while here. <clears throat> so anyway, let's read this before I dig a hole so deep. You know, that's what they say when you find yourself in a hole. Quit digging. I'm going to stop digging and start reading here. Both Jesus, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And he saith unto them, and he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning miracle, or this beginning of miracles, or this beginning of signs and tokens, did Jesus in Cain of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Now back again to Luke, where it says, this is the glory of the Lord, and the glory of the Lord is going to be revealed through this individual, who is bringing great joy to the whole earth. Amen? So those are important to remember. Praise the Lord. Now... Let, let's just think about this. Remember, this is 2,000 years ago in a completely different culture in Israel, a very highly uh, uh, focused uh, family, familial, if you will, culture. Family was everything. And so uh, weddings, you've got to remember in these small towns, everything developed out of the fact that family, in other words, you, you got married, you had children. The more children you had, the more the town grew. The more the town grew, the more prosperity there was for the town. There more, the more shops, the more uh, skills, the more everything. So it wasn't just a wedding to them. Weddings uh, and, and wedding feasts were a much bigger deal in Jesus' day than they are today. Each wedding was a public feast, and it was for the whole town. Everybody turned out. Everybody came because marriage was about the whole community. It wasn't just about this couple, but it was about their family before them, the family that would come after them, the, the connections you know, with other families, and, and so on and so forth. 
So it isn't surprising that ancient wedding feasts went on for at least a week. Some went on for a month. But even a what we would think of as a simple wedding, right? That's the one we have in the park with just you and your friends. That would have been a week long, at least a minimum. And when we talk about the big church weddings and all that, 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 would, that would have went on for up to 30 days. Now that's, that's a big deal. The town just... It shuts down. It just turns into one huge party. Praise the Lord. Any, amen. That's what, that's, that, you can uh, read uh, uh, Soderheim's uh, Jewish culture, uh, any of those books that talk about Judaism in the, in the first, second, third centuries, will tell you the same stuff. It was huge. It was just a major, major event. And so uh, this scripture opens on a real disaster. Just a day or two into the celebration, the family runs out of wine. And that happens to be the most important element in these feasts. In spite of our, a lot of our religious learning, wine was a big part of it. And it wasn't grape juice, it was wine. It was fermented wine. So imagine a town full of winos. After 30 days. Well, this, and they're expecting this. They're, they're expecting this is a big deal. They didn't have the Iowa State Fair to go to. They didn't, you know, they didn't go to Vegas, you know. It was right there. Whatever they were going to have, it happened in their community. They rarely traveled more than 8, 10 miles from their birthplace. So everything was condensed. Everything became a bigger deal there. So here they are two days into what they're expecting to be this great celebration and no wine. This is a, it's a disaster. It's, it's, a, it's a big deal. So the most important element in these feasts was wine. And now all of a sudden, the party's over. Now that wasn't just bad etiquette. It was a social and psychological catastrophe. This family is humiliated. The whole town thinks, what a bust. They were expecting a big deal. And all of a sudden, now nothing. Let's look at verse 11 of John 2 here. This beginning of miracles, or this, this first sign, did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed on him. So it's not just a miracle. It's a sign. It's signifying something. Amen? And it's through this sign, or this signification, if you will, that Jesus reveals his glory. It's, it's a big deal. It's more than just, you know, well, we're going to run down to the ABC store and get some Mogan David, and everything will be all right. It, this is a sign about everything he's here to do. It's significant, in other words. Amen? This is going to reveal his true identity. And the fact that he does this in this way makes it extremely interesting. Amen? Now look at, look at this introduction to Jesus. That's what it is. It's a ta da 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 Jesus. And he comes out, and what does he do? He turns water into wine. Amen? Why? Nobody's starving. Nobody's dying. Nobody's demon-possessed here, right? But this is his debut. This is God in the flesh, and the first thing he does isn't raise somebody from the dead. It isn't heal some leper. It isn't cast out a demon. Amen? It isn't feed multitudes. It's make wine for a party. I mean, our images of God are really skewed sometimes. But he chooses this, and this is why it's so interesting to me, because this is his signifying moment. This is his moment of introduction. This is, here's my card, the winemaker. Not the healer, amen, not the deliverer, not the demon caster outer, not the prosperity Jesus, not, not the, you know, the feeder of the hungry. 
but the wine supplier for the party. Praise the Lord. Amen. I guess, and that's why the disciples were saying, we believe. <laughs> we believe. There's something going on with this guy, I'm telling you. So John uses this supernatural, he, he says, according to John, that he, Jesus uses this supernatural power to bring a lot of great wine to keep the party going in order to keep this festival ongoing, right? Well, again, in that culture, running out of wine was more than a social embarrassment. But as bad as that was and as humiliating as it was for this couple and for this family, it wasn't a life or death situation. So what did this act signify? What did it signify about what Jesus came into this world to do? Because this is the beginning of his ministry. It's signifying, it's like saying, this is why I'm here. Now, from a religious perspective, if you look at it that way, and that's clearly what John's telling us, then we look at it and go, wow, this is why he came? Right? To supply a party? Look at John chapter 2 now in verse 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Now the ruler of the feast, he's the master of ceremonies. He's the guy that presides over this week, two week, three week, 30 day, 30 day part of it. He's the one that coordinates. Amen. He keeps everything together. It's his job to call the people to celebrate. It's his job to make sure that the conditions for the celebration are in place. In other words, it was his job to make the party great. His job is to make everybody have a good time. Go away saying, man, that was one of the best weddings I've ever been to. It was tremendous. That's his job. Amen? So when Jesus turns water into wine, that same day, What's it saying? He comes in and rescues the whole mess, right, and turns it back what had been depression and gloom and doom. Now all of a sudden, whoa, everybody's excited again. Not only did he show up with wine, he showed up with the best. Never had it so good. Amen? He shows up with the Dom Perignon. They'd been eating or drinking uh, Boone's Farm. And all of a sudden, they're going, hey, where's the screw-off caps? These are all corks. And, I mean, all of a sudden, they got the good stuff. Right? So when Jesus turns water into wine and he saves the day, can you see what it is he's really saying? Because this is still God in the flesh, and he's signifying something. He's saying, I've got a purpose, and I'm going to show you my purpose. This is my opening act. This is the, the big opening of what I'm here for, why I'm here, what I'm going to do. He's saying, I'm the true master of the banquet. I am Lord of the feast. Praise the Lord. Some, somebody would say, well, you know, I thought, I thought he came to humble himself. I, I thought he came to uh, give up his glory. I, I thought he, he was going to be rejected. I thought it was about going to the cross. Now, all of that's true. He's going to suffer. There's going to be denial. There's going to be sacrifice. But it's all a means to an end. And that end is a festival of joy. Jesus knows this. The others are just thinking about more wine. But Jesus is not baffled by the situation. He's, he's involved in it. Amen. In order to bring about resurrection and a new heaven and a new earth and to end all evil and wipe away every tear. That's what he's here for. But nothing compares to the eternal feast that's coming at the end of history. Praise the Lord. Those that believe in him are going to have 
within them a stream of that joy. Amen? A foretaste of that joy. Now, right now, praise the Lord, it's like living water. And that is ultimately what he came to bring. That's why this is his first sign. Now, the more you get into this, the more you realize he's, he's, he's really laying out everything that he's going to do. And he's doing it all in this one little capsulated sign that goes so much further than we recognize. Look at Psalms 34 and verse 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. When the ruler of the feast, when the master of ceremonies took a sip of that new wine, he flipped out. He said, man, this is great. They usually give the good stuff in the beginning until everybody gets drunk, and then they bring out the cheap stuff and nobody knows the difference. Right? Because they're already drunk. But you saved this really good stuff he tasted it, and he said, it's good. I've tasted it. It's good. Have at it. Amen. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. You say, well, well, come on, Nathan. We already know that the Lord's good. Yeah, but David wants us to go beyond a mental ascent, which is what we were talking about here this morning when we talk about faith and all this. Yeah, we believe. He's saying, go beyond this mental decision, uh, ascent, uh, uh, acceptance or, uh, you know, just saying, I, I assent to this, I agree to this, I understand this, or I believe this. He's saying, he's making it a proposition, or we, we use English so screwed up, it's a proposition. Proposition is pr a proposition, a position that says, ha, I know something here. I'm not just guessing at it. I have a proposition. I have a proposition in this situation. And that's what David is saying. Of course you know the Lord is good, but I want you to taste it. I want you to experience the goodness of the Lord. I want you to have a proposition about this, not just a well, he's good. We, that, we know he's good. No. You've got to taste and see that the Lord is good. Have an experience in God that settles something in you that you know God is good. I know He's good. I've tasted the Lord and He is good. Praise the Lord. Look at Isaiah chapter 25 now, verses 6 through 8. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things and a feast of wines on the lees, of fat things full of marrow, of wines on the lees well refined. And he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death in victory, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces, and the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. Now, this mountain is Mount Zion that he's talking about because in, actually, in, uh, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 5, verse 7, it talks about David going and taking Zion. It's another name for Jerusalem. It's just another description of Jerusalem. Now, we know in Galatians chapter 4, uh, Paul tells us the story about Hagar and Sarah. And he said one is like, he uses them as a metaphor, he says one is, is like uh, Hagar, she's like Mount Sinai. The law, rules, regulations, death, curses. But he said, no, this, this child, this celebration, this celebration he's talking about is Mount Zion. It's what Revelation talks about, Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. He said that's what Paul refers to it as Jerusalem. He doesn't call it Zion, but it, they're interchangeable words. That's what Isaiah is prophesying. And that's what Jesus is celebrating. He's manifesting what Isaiah prophesied a couple thousand years prior, or at least a thousand years earlier. Amen? He says, aged wines, best meats, finest wines. He's going to take away the disgrace, D 
the embarrassment, the humiliation. Amen? He's going to wipe away tears. Now, here's where I got my, uh, my moment of uh, Blues Brothers uh, rush. When Su Suzanne talked about J.R.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, there's a, if you ever read it, you'll know that there's a, there's a story in there, I mean, within the story, where Samwise Ganji, amen, wakes up, Rescued from the fires of Mount Doom. Right now, he's freaked out. He doesn't even really know what happened. He just comes to, and he, and he sees that Gandalf is still alive. Right? And here's what he says. He says, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead. And then he says this. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Every tear will be wiped away. In essence, everything sad is going to come untrue. Now, if that doesn't give you the joy of the Lord, you're not hearing me. Because I don't know whatever anybody goes through. But I'm telling you, there's a day coming that we'll all be there. We'll all experience when every sad thing will come untrue. Every loved one that we've lost, every heartbreak, every loss, everything the devil has stolen or tried to steal or robbed or created issues and relationships, every sad thing will become untrue. You know what that means? That means you won't have a sad memory of it. It just won't be true. It, 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 and, and here's what I'm telling you. For us who have tasted that the Lord is good. Yeah. It's untrue today. Sad things are untrue things. Praise the Lord. We're not just waiting for heaven. Right. We're living in that stream. We're living. We have a taste of the Lord. We have that river of life. We have that, that fountain of water welling up inside of us. The joy of of the Lord is our strength. Praise the Lord. Amen. And that is what Jesus came to do. Jesus came, and that's what he's telling us in this story, he came to make every sad thing a lie, every sad thing untrue. Praise the Lord. He restores the years that the canker worm has stolen or destroyed that the palmer worm has, you know, I mean, that's what he does. He restores. We're talking about restoration. If you, if you need restoration, you come to the right place because there's no better that restoring than Jesus Christ. He, he makes every sad thing untrue. He makes every sad thing a lie. Praise God. Hallelujah. So Jesus says, I am the Lord of the feast. And in the end, I come to bring joy. Not just salvation, not just healing, not just deliverance, but I've come to give you joy. So you can have joy even when the doctor gives you a diagnosis. You can have joy because you know every sad thing is going to come untrue. He, he cannot force that on me. I can still have the joy of the Lord when my bank account doesn't fit my outgo, my need, amen, I can have confidence because, amen, he's given me his joy, that's what he's given me, on top of everything else, he's given me joy so that I can trust him, I can depend on him no matter what it looks like, no matter what the circumstances are, I can have the joy of the Lord because he's going to make every sad thing untrue, amen. praise God, praise God, and that's why my first sign, my first miracle is to set everybody laughing. Amen. You, you know, I'm saying we got to think different about this God. And the first sign that he gives is, come on, get happy. You know, don't be sad, be happy. Amen. Have a here. I know we don't like that because religiously we think, oh my God, he's, 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 he's schizophrenic. 
No, we're ignorant. He's the same. Yesterday, he's the same one that said it in Isaiah. He's the same one that did it in John. And he's the same one who does it for us every single minute of every day. He's saying, and you can take this any way you want to. I don't care what your theology is. He's saying, have another. And David is saying, taste and see that the Lord is good. And David is saying, thank you, Lord. I'll have another. Fill it up. He's come to give us joy. You can, you can use whatever kind of metaphors and theological kind of twists that you want to put on this. I'm telling you, I'm just telling you exactly what it was. This is the natural with the supernatural. Hallelujah. Well, that tells us why he came. Or at least it tells us what he came to bring, right? He came to bring joy. Praise the Lord. But why did he have to bring it? I want you to notice something. He's going to rescue this bride and groom from their screw-up, from their poor planning, from their lack of foresight, or lack of funds. How's he going to do it? He's going to do it by filling up jars that used to be used and were, even at that day, jars that were used by Jews for ceremonial washings. He took something totally unreligious from something very religious. He produced something very spiritual and life-giving and joy out of something that had been dead you know, and, and heavy and weighty and, and, and shameful and depressed. Amen? He's, he's pointing to our spiritual needs. Our need for cleansing. Our need for atonement. Our need for pardon. You know, the Jews had all kinds of, uh, of uh, these purification rites and rituals. They had these mitzvahs outside the temple. They had to go and bathe in these, we, we now call it baptism, but they were literally, had to wash themselves before they could enter in. They had, that's why they had these big jugs, clay jugs, for purifal, purification. They had to be washed. They had to cleanse themselves in order to be accepted. Right? And so they had all these things and, and the, what those things were for was they led up to the sacrifices. So you had to have all these purifications before there could be a blood sacrifice. You had to be cleansed. You had to be before you could even bring your sacrifice. Amen? So that's what the jars were normally used for. Now remember, the lack of wine supply was more than just an embarrassment and a humiliation to these people. It was a an outrageous uh, act of, uh, of dishonor. Because it dishonored not only them, but their family. And by extension, the entire community is shamed by this couple. Because it's not just a couple getting married. It represents everything. It represents their family. It represents that community now. So... They let their family down. They let the community down. And in that culture, that was a huge deal. And Jesus rescues them from every bit of that. No shame, no embarrassment, no humiliation. Just party like it's 1999. And he does it by using those ceremonial jars. And by doing that, he says, I came into the world to accomplish in reality what those things only symbolize. This is not about religion. 
It has never been about religion. Jesus came to cleanse us. He came to purify us from what is spiritually wrong with us. And if he did that, thank you, Lord, I'll have another. The joy of the Lord is our strength. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's happy time. It's happy hour, every hour. I know some may think, well, you're just degrading the message. No, I, I'm telling you what, G, G, this is the metaphor he chose. Praise God. How, I mean, how, how, does, how does Jesus bring healing? How does he bring cleansing? And, and how does he bring forgiveness? I want, you to, I want you to see something that's really weird in this story. Mary tells Jesus that the party's out of wine. Now, maybe she's just telling him while she's telling everybody. But I doubt it. Because she knows there's something supernatural about this guy. He's not just another one of the guests. He could probably do something about this. But look at this. She, she knows he's not ordinary, so she tells him the problem. And then look what happens. John chapter 2, verse 4. Jesus says to her, Woman... What have I to do with thee? Mine hour has not yet come. Now that is closer to the way he would have said it. It wasn't, woman, woman, woman. No, woman, what have I to do with you? What's this got to do with me? My hour hasn't come. Now that's kind of sharp and, and, and curt or short with his mother. Now this is a culture that family is very, very important, and you don't disrespect. I mean, you can be stoned to death for disrespecting your parents. So there's, there's something else going on here, and, and uh, amen, it sounds like he's just really upset, like he's being totally insensitive to his mother. But if you base this on all the other scriptures that we have about Jesus, he's not easily irritated. He doesn't just say stuff that he's going to regret later. He doesn't get angry, right, over hardly anything. In fact, he's hanging on the cross, and he's not yelling and screaming at these people and, and, and being angry. He's saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Amen? So he's, he doesn't use harsh words. So this isn't just he's having a bad mood. He, he's having a bad day, or, or he's just you know, not feeling good. He says, mine hour has not yet come. And several times in the book of John alone, Jesus refers to his hour. And his hour, every time he speaks of it, he's talking about his death. He's talking about the moment of his death on the cross. That's his hour. That's what he's referring to. So Mary says, what a disaster. They've run out of wine. And Jesus said, what are you telling me for? I'm not ready to die. That's the translation. That's what he's saying. So it's unlikely that Mary really knew what my hour was. I mean, that she didn't necessarily understand that. She just knew that he was able to do things that others couldn't do, but she didn't know. Not, none of them believed, really, that he was going to be crucified. I've talked about this before. Even though he tells them over and over and over, on Easter morning, quote, unquote, or resurrection morning, they're all there looking for a body. They're not looking for a resurrection. They didn't believe he was going to be crucified. We thought he was the one. That's what the guys on the road to Emmaus said. And now he's dead. I guess we missed it. Even though they, he was to, they were told over and over, I, I got to die. I got to be crucified. Even, even uh, Peter said, no, it ain't going to happen, not as long as I'm around. So they just, they didn't, they just didn't get it, so it's not likely that Mary understood that what this hour was. But look at verse 5 then. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. So, okay, great. But what's Jesus thinking? Why does he connect a simple request for wine with the hour of his death? 
because that's exactly what's happened when you read this in the context of the way it was spoken or the way John was trying to present it. This, this sign, this opening revelation of God. Think of the symbolism here. The miracle is going to be a sign of what has to come or what Jesus has come to do. What's the one represent in his mind? What's, what's missing from the picture that's necessary to turn the shame of this couple to joy? Cleansing. I mean, in the big picture, right? He's, this wedding is like a microcosm. And he's showing us a sign of everything within this feast, within this wedding. What's going to take to turn the shame to joy? We take away the demand of the law and give you the joy of the Lord. I'll cleanse you by grace, and then we'll celebrate it with new wine. Joy. Not shame, not guilt, not fear, not anxiety. Because he creates the wine in the jars for purification and cleansing. He uses the very jars that were meant for purification and cleansing to make wine. Praise the Lord. Look at verse 4. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. So it's like he's looking past Past his mother, he's, he's looking past the bride and the groom. He's actually looking past this whole wedding scene. He's there, and yet he's looking at something beyond this. He's seeing something else. And he's thinking, yeah, I can bring celebration. I can bring joy to this world. I can cleanse mankind from its guilt. I can cleanse them from their shame. I've come into this world to bring joy. But mom, I'm going to have to die to do it. So it, in the midst of this celebration, he's having a whole other thing going on in him. Everybody else is celebrating. Everybody else is rejoicing over the wine. And he's looking past all of it. He's using all of this as the sign of why I'm here what I came to do, how I'm going to do it. And most of them are just caught up in the moment. Praise the Lord. Look at Revelation chapter 21 and verse 2. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And back up to Revelation 19, verse 9. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. At the end of time, that's what John's talking about here, the same one who wrote this, parable or this story, this sign of Jesus at the wedding, at the end of time, there's going to be a feast to end all feasts. Praise the Lord. This is how history ends. This is how time ends and we move into eternity. The earth, I'm talking about the whole world. Praise the Lord. We the bride, that's us people that Jesus has loved, finally united with him. But the wedding he's attending here is just the, the dimmest hint or echo of this great cosmic future reality. And yet, he's seeing the big deal, the whole deal, and this little, simple community, family, wedding. You know, I thought
thought about this. What, what, do, what do single people think about at a wedding? Well, I've done a lot of weddings. And I can tell you what most of them are thinking about. Not that wedding. They're thinking about their wedding. They're single, but they're thinking about down the road. I wouldn't do that. I would have done this. I wouldn't have that color. I'd have had this color. I mean, we know it is true because even the bride throws away the bouquet and all the single girls. Yeah. <laughs> I'm next. I got my plan. Well, don't doubt that men are doing the same thing. Maybe not on the same level, but they're looking at it and they're thinking, I would have had the stag party, you know, here or somewhere else or whatever, but they're thinking about what if it were me? Someday, it'll be my day. Someday it'll be my wedding. Well, I think that's exactly what Jesus was doing. He's, he's looking at this thing and he's thinking, man, nothing compared to the one I'm going to have. I want him to enjoy this. I want him to have a good time. But this is so nothing compared to what's coming. And that's what he's talking about there in Revelation. You know, he didn't come to be an example for us to imitate. I was thinking, Eric and Rita have been a real blessing to this church. I know he had to leave probably to work. He worked on Sundays a lot of times, but They've done a lot of things that you guys just don't know about because they don't want anybody knowing. They just do stuff. And they came just because Rita went by here one day and she said, I just felt like this is where we needed to go. Didn't know anything about the church. Just showed up and they've been faithful ever since. I married the couple. And uh, I, I thought, you know, Rita didn't become a Seskus, that's their last name, by acting like Eric She just married him. And she is a Seskus. And that's what Jesus is trying to get us to understand. You've been betrothed. In Jewish culture, that's as good as being married. You're just waiting for the party. Praise the Lord. Jesus didn't come to tell us how to save ourselves. But he came to save us himself. He didn't come to show us how to do the purification rites, the right amount of water in the right jug in the right place at the right time. He came to cleanse us. He's the living water. The thing that makes us white as snow and cleanses us. He came to die, to shed his blood, to take the cup of sorrows, it says, so that we can raise the cup of joy and blessing here and now. So by choosing these ceremonial jars, Jesus shows what the book of Hebrews does in, in a lot more detail. And that is that he fulfills the whole Old Testament sacrificial system. Everything from beginning to end. Every time God chooses a metaphor... And, and they're used there to help us see him better. It also shows us how he sees us. If he's like our bridegroom, and you give yourself to Jesus by faith, then he must really delight in you. Every time God chooses an image for himself, he's saying something about us. You know what the bride looks like to the bridegroom as she walks down the aisle? Perfect. Beautiful. She wears the most beautiful garments and jewels, and when he lays eyes on her, he is absolutely delighted in her. He wants to give her the world. All the love songs, 
Well, I'll give you the moon, stars. Right? I mean, that's natural. He wants to give us the world. We are the inheritors of the world. He delight in us. We are without spot and without wrinkle. Perfect in his eyes. Don't let religion teach you anything other than that. Here's the kind of the, another way of looking at this, and I'll, I'll, I'll quit with this. We need to deal with our present by looking at our future. This is kind of, the, uh, uh, again, it's a way of encapsulating what he says. We look at things that are not as though they are. So deal with it by looking at the future. So we're, we're saying, okay, here's the natural reality. But the truth is the manifestation. So I have to look to the manifestation, which in this realm is future. It isn't future. It's only here that it's future because we're operating in time. And God is now. It's, it's right now. So in the spirit, we have to operate from that reality. And then in the natural, if, if you're going to get into the natural, then let's do it the way Jesus did it and look at the now by the future. Jesus sat right in the middle of all this joy of a wedding feast, and he's sipping sorrow. Praise the Lord. So today, we that believe in him, that are espoused to him, that are his bride, can sit in the middle of all the chaos and the sorrow and the negativity that we deal with on a regular basis via the news and life in general. We can sit right in the middle of all that, sipping the coming blood that's ours now. So I'm just saying, drink deep. I'll have a double. Just, in fact, give me the bottle. Can you say praise the Lord? This is the God that we serve. He's not a God of religion. He's a God who came and chose his very first sign, his opening expression of who he was, the thing that would mark everything from that point on. And he says, here I am, enjoy. Enjoy life. Love life. Expect good things. Shame, guilt, it's no longer a part of our vocabulary. For that, I'll give you a party. Give him a hand clap this morning. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. We, of all people, should be a happy people. Amen. I'm saying there aren't times when the sadness comes, but we should never let it get us down. Joy ought to be the byword for us, no matter what's going on. Amen. I was talking to Don Wyckoff one time. We were saying crap happens sometimes. And I said, I don't know. I have trouble sleeping sometimes. And he said, uh, I said, I think about just going out and getting a jug or maybe just a glass, some old scotch, maybe 12 year old. <laughs> something, something closer to my age. And he said, yeah, or two. <laughs> now, I'm not encouraging you to do that. I'm just saying the metaphor that God gives us is we, we put way, way too much emphasis on things that he isn't troubled with in the least. What troubles him is our effort to purify ourselves and to perfect ourselves and try to create joy when all we, the best we can hope for is to have a good day. Have one day when I'm happy, knowing that tomorrow's going to be a slap in the face. Right? That, is that what the world teaches us? If you have a good day, you're immediately concerned about something bad's going to happen because this ain't right. And we should live our lives joyfully. 
enjoying it. Yes. The blessings. And you can do it if you'll believe in the future that he's declared is yours, yes. not the one the enemy's trying to sell you. Right. Amen? God bless all of you. Have a great week. Appreciate you all coming out today. Have a good one. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Be strong this week in the Lord. Have some joy. Hallelujah. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.